I was laying in a $25 hotel the other night that I didn't want to be in on a bed that I felt like, my goodness, Lord, protect me. I feel like I'm on the mission field. Because that was the best in town, and it was like, you know, help us, Lord. And just sitting in such an adverse situation, having such an amazing encounter with God. You know what this amazing encounter with God was and that I have? It's not some great flashing light. It's not some, you know, sound of trumpets. It's just laying there, sitting there, standing there, going, I know you hear. I know you see me. And then you begin to talk out of that. Whew, there's nothing like that. All the doubt, God in his love, because he's willing to respond to a heart, pushes all the doubt out of the way so that you and I can begin to not have to be so shrouded and clouded by our issues. So shrouded and clouded by all the stuff that we hold important in our life. Just because we want him, to, he just comes and steps in, takes that, pushes it all out. That's an encounter. The word that you're just, you're just there in a some place. Maybe it's as bad as a place as I was in. There was nothing good about my environment. Everywhere, er, let's think about this. Where every action is a reaction to him. I just want, I want I want you to let, as we get into worship, I want you to let that soak into you. Okay, I want you to think about this. Where you lay aside every idea, every, every, every reaction, reactions that we have planned in our head and in our mind and our thinking, that we just do this because this is what we do and this is what's expected of us and this is what the movement says and this is what everybody else did when they got touched. No, no, no. Through hunger and a thirst for an interaction with God, I suddenly have an encounter then I bow down. It, that's, his action creates a reaction in me. And so I'm going to stand here and say, no, Father, I'm not, I'm not, because otherwise you can get lost up. You can get caught up. You can get caught up and literally imprisoned and shut God out of your life by all the ritual, by all the expectation. Well, I can predict what we're supposed to do. So my legs hand on me, I'm supposed to fall down. I fall down. I don't fall down when I can't stand up no more. And it ain't about you know standing, falling or standing. It ain't even about that. I mean, people are so stuck in their head. I don't know if I should fall down. I should stand up. If I don't fall down, then I can think I'm receiving it. <laughs> you shut God completely out of the picture. God can't. Father can't even be real. He wants to be real. What he wants to hear is how we get to be real with God. Uh -uh. I tell you right now, there was a time in my life I wanted Father so much. I'm going to tell you right now, if, if, if everybody that was getting touched by God was running and diving head first, I'd do that. Because I, it didn't, didn't matter. If everybody was shaking, I'd shake. I don't care what you got to do. If I was jumping up, kicking, or, uh, you, know, you know, feet up in the air, I mean, I'd do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I'm just stand there. Act. Couldn't you, you hear what I'm saying? When you recognize there's a move of God, I just, I, there's something about imitating. So, you know, that, that's real. That's real because you're just hungry. How hungry are you? Huh? What do I got to do? What am I going to have to do to have a touch from heaven? Stand, with one, stand on one foot? Stand on no feet? Whatever. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Father. And then somebody says, well, when does that stop? That don't ever stop. When that stops, you stop. When that stops, you no longer moving forward, you moving backwards. When the hunger and the thirst and the passion stops. Where do you get to do that? Where do you get to learn to prophesy? You get to learn, where do you get to learn to flow in the things of the, of the Spirit? You get to learn to flow in the things of the Spirit by interacting with Him, by reacting to Him. I'm going to react to Him. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to react to Him. I'm going to react to His presence. I'm going to react to what He's doing. 
I recognize in a place, and, and that's what I was saying, I recognize in God, in a place God is doing something, I don't feel nothing. I'm going to get in somewhere. I'm not going to stand on the outside. Uh, I'm going to get right in the big middle. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? Yes. Somebody say, well, I don't see that reacting. That's reacting. That's reacting. You may not feel nothing, but you see a reality of what God's doing. You jumping in the middle and you reacting to a move of God, to a manifestation of God. You know, we got to quit acting like, well, if the Lord wants me, he knows where to find me. Because you never, you know, look. He already, look. It ain't going to work. A passionate pursuit of him. That's just so true. Every false thing is a hindrance between me and him. I'll move it out of the way. I'm not going to go to prayer because, I, because it's a ritual or because I have to. Because even the most upright, the most pure man is vile before him. Listen to me. Compared to him, vile. Vile. He gave to us a gift. He gave to us a gift. He held out his scepter and said, come here. Come. Come, I put my anointing upon you. I put my glory upon you. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you right now. Abba, and a walk with God is an ever-deepening de experience of divine power and grace just like ezekiel 47 describes it's a deepening relationship because you don't let up if i were in the midst of of, of men cursing and swearing and saying every vile thing yet if every possible opposition was there i'd find a place of solitude there in that chaos to interact with him you in a place with him none of that stuff here you can't sip on your rumpus. You listening to me? You can't sit in a, in a place of less than passion. You cannot sit in a place of less than passion. God is raising up a generation of people that are passionate. You listen to me. When a light is shining, you don't have to tell men in darkness, hey, did you notice that there was a light? You don't have to go say, hey, you know, actually, um, let me tell you that I'm light. And they're going, where? <laughs> the Lord lights up a life to set it in the highest place. And we're going to have to grab a hold of the reality that the Holy Spirit wants to do far more than what we're allowing him to do. We're going to have to grab a hold of this now. Because Father's made it available. But he's only going to move with truth. He's not going to move with tense and pretense and all the other stuff. He's not going to move because of this. And that. I think one of my greatest breakthroughs is when I'm sitting on a platform, and I wish you could hear this and apply it to your life. And I knew there wasn't going to be, and there was 5,000 people there continually every night because another preacher was in town. I knew that I was going to get there. There was going to be maybe t the first two rows were going to be taken up. And it was the first row. And I sat over there saying, Lord, why, why do you do this to me? Why? Like a being all arrogant with arrogance I didn't know I had. Having all expectations of things that were wrong. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, why are you doing it? I began to sweep and sob and tremble for you, Lord. Because if you changed my life, it was, a, it was moments that God has prepares moments of time to change your life. But you never get to enter into the moment of time until you get so real. Not surreal. So real. We got to move out of the surreal into the so real. That isn't easy. This isn't easy. People say, oh, I understand. You don't. You don't understand it. Only God can give you revelation. He only going to give you revelation because you, because he gave you something like a talent. And you go, I want more. So therefore, to those who have, we shall give them more. More shall be given. To those who have not, even then which they seem to have, 
it should be taken away. And there's no example of that. There's no example of that like the man who was, one, who was given a gift from God and he hid it in the earth because he had other interests. I had other things I need to take care of. God gives us something to take it and multiply it. He gives us something to take it and utilize it. He gives us access, in other words, into his presence to pursue it. If we got other interests, forget about it. You just take it in and you just hide it in the earth. You hide it in the earth of your own life. I'm going to take that which he's given me. I'm and that which he's given me is access into his presence, the ability to ask whatever I want. And he's going to do it, the ability to come to learn how to walk in all the ways of his life, to receive freely from him the gift of righteousness. So I said, oh, you got to prove it. I didn't prove nothing. I received it freely. I've been given the gift of righteousness. This is mine. Ain't nobody going to take it from me. He gave it to me. No one should take my uprightness from me. You know where Job got his uprightness? It's proven where he got his uprightness. His trust for the Father was not religious uprightness. You know where he got his purity from? From the Father. It was proven. It was proven. Where he got it? Where did you get yours? Be careful. Because if your little circumstances and situations take away from you your confidence and your boldness and your access, you're basically operating in too much self-righteousness. Hmm. I'm telling you right now, this glory, hallelujah, was freely given. Hey, how can you boast yourself as though you receive, as though you did not receive something, as though you earned it? In other words, Paul said to the Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter four. I think it's like around verse seven, something like that. We, we we've all been given it. It's been received freely. You've received. When 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 you feel good about yourself, forget about yourself. Forget about whether you feel good about yourself or bad about yourself or whether you achieve whatever. The way up is down, always. It's humility before honor. People just want to kind of hover and go forward. No, God's going to teach you and me brokenness and humility. He's going to, you know what he's going to teach us? You know, what the hardest thing to, you know what the hardest thing is to get from God? Reality. Truth. We live in shadows. We live in pretend. Men empower us and they say, you are an engineer. Oh, now if you're going to be a successful engineer, then this is what you're going to do. And they mold us. And we lay on that identity. And we live in it. And it's a falsehood. And then, you know, you've done good. And then we feel good about ourselves. You've done bad. We feel bad about ourselves. It's a falsehood. It's a lie. It's, a, it's not even, it's meaningless. It has nothing to do with interaction with God and what he said about us. You can become an untouchable one. Then no matter what anybody says about you, no matter how they feel about you, it isn't even relevant. It doesn't even matter. You can have everybody staring at you with knives. It doesn't even matter. You're unaffected by it because their value of you, what they think of you is meaningless. All of your reactions is a result of an interaction with Almighty God. Think about that. Just think about that. What a place. What a shelter. What a place of safety. What a, what a rock to be built upon. No storm can mess with you. No, no turbulence, no circumstance. Nothing can alter you like a big giant oak tree planted by the living, the waters of life cannot be moved. It ain't coming down. And it can't be transplanted. And should you hew or chop at it, steal, it'll spring back up. Uh, it's roots too far down. Hallelujah. Ain't ever going to get rid of it. Uh-uh. Come on, think about this. Father starts us off with real simple beginnings. He said, now I've got to have all your identity in me. You no longer live. We, have a, we won't even start step one. All of my identity in him no longer live. Everything that you're going to be able to do, because my grace gives it to you, and I determine you should do it. We don't want to do what we're. You know, you listen to me, because you've been you've been raised in a culture of performance based living, huh? And that's all an illusion, because the race does not to the swiftest, huh? The success does not to the brightest. It's not. 
Come on now. We've got to get out of that. Because all the stuff that we're allowing to be important to us are lies. And it's keeping us from walking in the truth. Which means it keeps us from interacting with the spirit truth. Father gave you and I. God, you, God has given you something today. He's giving you the privilege of access into his presence with a gift of righteousness and the gift of holiness. He's giving you this wonderful life born of the spirit, born of the water, born of the word, washed in the blood, name written in heaven so that you may walk in. That's got to become valuable to you if you want to increase. That's what he's giving you. That's the talent he's giving to you. That's the riches. In other words, he gave you riches. Because it would actually be better to say he gave wealth. And to one he gave the wealth of, of five. And to another two and to another one. God, there's not a single person here who's called upon the name of the Lord Jesus that you don't have one portion of wealth. What are you going to do with it? Well, I want to be this, and I want to be that, and I want to do this, and what about them, and where, where do I get to measure up, and how can I stand tall among the mighty? You need to walk small among the mighty. Let God make you tall. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you to do time. i tell you right now, who's getting exalted? By the Father, those who humble themselves. Under His hand. Started getting happy about everybody else being blessed. Started blessing people who cursed them. Started just living by Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I believe people would live their life by Matthew 5, 6, and 7. A light would begin to shine. We want God's light of glory to shine without <laughs> walking in His Word, which is the light. <laughs> His Word lights you up <laughs> so you can shine. People want to have the, 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 people want to have the manifestations of the Spirit of holiness. In other words, the gifts. Without the holiness, you can't have it. You're going to have some similitude of something. It looks like it. It, it just becomes, it be, almost becomes like a sleight of hand. It did. It looked like it, but it didn't really, wa really was. It was more emotion than it was reality. Okay, forget about it. I'd rather have, I'd rather look like the, a blooming butt naked idiot. That's the prophet. He had to go walk around prophesying naked i'd rather look like that and have the reality of interaction with father and be doing what he's told me to do come on then have all the praises of men and putting it on come on now this is something you got to grab a hold of in your spirit i didn't come here because i have to i'm coming here because it's the religious thing to do i just resurrection this is i'm celebrating the resurrection i came here because it's a reaction to his acting upon me uh Hallelujah. Ah, Ramon Sadeaki. What, what, what was that action upon me? His word was an, is an action upon me. His word is not dead letter. His word is living and it's powerful. Somebody said, ah, oh, the, the, you know, the, the letter of the law kills. I'm not talking about no letter of the law. I'm talking about the letter of the covenant. I'm talking about the letter of relationship. I'm talking about the, the letter of this uh, new life in God. Think about it, dear people. Spirit and it's life. It's living and it's powerful. What happens when you begin to react to the action of God's word? What happens when you begin to obey? Then what happens is because you have something and you lay hold on it and you take and you won't let it slip, God gives him more. He just keeps giving more. He says, Unto you it is given. To know the mysteries of the kingdom. Father gives it. He's freely given it. He's opened up our eyes to understand it. Because we will be, why? Because we were willing to turn just like they turn and begin to walk with them. Come with me. Let me come with me. Leave that stuff behind. What? All the things that I value, all the things that are important to me, all the things that from childhood I was taught to make meaningful, that I was taught to live my life for. Leave it. Come, let me show you another way. Come, the kingdom is now at hand. Jesus comes and declares, the king has come. 
The angels declared, Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Behold, this day is born in Bethlehem, in the city of David, Christ the Lord. The king has come, his kingdom now begun to be signed, sealed, delivered in his own blood. Take into his hand a scroll that no man in earth, in heaven or under the earth, is found worthy to open up. The scroll of God's divine gift and grace and life and power and glory. Given to men, established with men forever. Who are willing to walk with him, learn righteousness. Oh, you never get, I don't care how, just I don't care how hard you try. Until you're born of the Spirit, you don't have the nature to learn it God's way. All you can learn is the righteousness of men. All you can learn is the integrity of men. All you can learn is the uprightness of men, what men think is good. No, they like you because, oh, you honorable. They don't even know what honor is. Oh, they like you because they think you're honest. They don't even know what honesty is. They just have a little small token of it, and it's subjective. Huh? And as long as, it, as long as it pleases them on their scale, then you are. I'm going to tell you right now, they're still saying you're unhonorable behind your back because that's just the way men are. If you're depending upon that, you ain't going to have nothing. Oh, well, I just want to walk in integrity before me. You know, this, uh, this crazy notion, I just want to be upright before men. What? They're talking bad about you as soon as you, as soon as you left the room. Why you doing all the stuff you can do to be upright before them? Yeah, man, that's no light. That's no glory. The Lord didn't say, your light will be your integrity. Your honesty. Your uprightness. They did not say that. Jesus is the light. The very living power. And nobody, nobody gets to see Jesus without the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that reveals him. You know, I've got to learn how to walk in a whole new dimension of life. A whole other value system. Is it going to have honesty in it? Absolutely. There's going to be no lie in it. Huh? Is it going to have integrity? Yeah, and it's going to be so full of integrity, men won't even be able to recognize it. Because it will not be limited to their perception of integrity. Integrity is defined by men is that you did, me, you did right by me according to my standard of what I expect you to do for me. That's it. And it usually that's, that's involved on in how much money they got out of the deal. It's very self-serving. Just it, self-serving. Think about it. Just think about it. Think about it. Wrong judgments will keep you out of this realm. The Lord just tries to start us off real simple. You no longer live. I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you one portion of wealth. It's I see, fierce father saying, all I see from here on out is Christ. You no longer live. Fierce father says, comes to you and says, Jason, you no longer live. It's only Jesus. And you're going, oh, yeah, I live. Oh, yeah, I'm feeling really bad about myself. Oh, mm, yeah, just totally bummed. Father said, you're just going to have to get over that if you want to take the next step because I got more. Because to him to have, she received more. If you have, you have it. You, if you have it, you, guess what? You're not wondering if you have it. You know you have it. I got it. It's mine. Here's mine. It's here. Right here. It's mine. They that have, she received more. They that don't have, that which they seem to have should be taken away from them. It's the fundamental rule. Katakina kasateya. Hallelujah. Hambrusta. Sometimes I think that worship ought to be at the end of the meeting. That's usually the way it was in the scripture. You know, after Jesus, they cut, you know, Jesus highlights it on the Passover, right? They had Passover, and then they got, they sang, they got, they got up and they sang together, and then they went out. Hallelujah. Huh? Well, we sing together, and then we take up the offering, and then we, and then we, and then we. Then we try to prime the people while we're getting this dust, so we pump the people. We're still just getting little spurts every once in a while. Then we go ahead and kick the people. <laughs> See if we get some action. Yeah. 
and so is church. And we got tired of that, and one preacher said to me, it's just so much nicer just to let it all go and tell everybody about love. <laughs> just forget about it all and just tell everybody that the Lord loves them and we love them and they're just loved, and just sit there and just let them be sorrowful and tell them, come now, we would pray for you and the Lord would touch you and, you know, give it just super light sermon. Not light sermon, super light sermon. There's so much more. I know, it's just wonderful. We just walk up to the Lord and say, okay, here we are. Lord, all I want is you. Go ahead. Erase the, erase the chalkboard of my life. All the ritual that I'm involved in, I don't know that I'm involved in, and I ask you to just remove it away. So I said, how can I do that? How can I sort it all out? Here's it. It's real simple. Let all of your reactions be from the interaction with him his action i'm here i'm here today wanting to have an encounter with him that will cause me to fall down and i will i will i will have an interaction with him today i do every day continually i've set my heart to it i'm not doing nothing religiously Hallelujah. Is a reaction. That's a reaction. No, no, that wasn't religious. That wasn't spiritual. It was a reaction to the Holy Masaya. The Holy Stakia Niki. The Holy Spanaya Tia Propositi Kadal. Dea Patina. It's the Atiya. It's a joy. It's peace. You know, when we, go, when we go out from this place, people should see upon our face and in our life such a steady, beautiful, wonderful peace. They should see within our life such a deep compassion. Do you know that you don't get to move any more forward in God until you're willing to embrace more compassion? You don't. You're stuck. Until you're willing to lay down your life for others, not because you have to, because, but because the compassion compels you. So what if, what if, what if you're just stuck? They're being mean to me. They're being ornery to me. They're talking bad about me. You just got you and yourself and you. Because you got to get over it. One person, somebody say, he's talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. I'm talking about me. And I'm talking about you. You are right. But you know what? We're not just talking about you. Because everybody in here that's got any sense knows I'm talking about you. Everybody else is aloof. If there's the greatest insight and wisdom that you and I can take a hold of in God is the insight and the wisdom to be able to identify the self. Because until you can identify the self, you can never deny it. And it's a fundamental thing that we got to do. And so the Lord starts us off, two hands for beginners. You no longer live. That's right. <laughs> Let me write that down somewhere. Where's it? You know, you already got 10,000 post-it notes. I no longer live. And they're just plastered. I mean, you got the wall covering. I no longer live. And you forgot, oh yeah, I no longer live. It's Christ Jesus who lives. It's not about me, it's about him. Lord, just, hallelujah. I get to walk this thing out. I don't have to walk it out nervously. Oh, no, am I doing it right? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not sure. I am confident. I'm living out his life. He's ordained it. He orchestrates it. He orders our steps. Every day, every year, every day, every month, every day, every week, every month, every year, every decade, takes us deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Not to say that you couldn't start from day one, go over there and jump in a deep. But men hold, hold on to their own lives too much to do that. And Father's willing to just gently lead us. Come on now, come on, take another step. 
Come on, you can trust me. Come on. And maybe, reality of it is, maybe in large part the Lord spends our whole life in interaction and action with Him is Him just coaching us to take another little teeny step. Come on. Five years later. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. And He's so loving and passionate. You do it. Whereas the people who've got a success story or ministry to, to develop, they're just going to, well, I'm out of here. Because I know I felt that. I felt that more times than one. I'm waiting on these people to take another step over the next decade. <laughs> Father, come on. Trust me. Come on. Come on. Jeez. His father is amazing, isn't he? Well, I noticed that a lot of people sh forgot to shut, set their, their clocks. <laughs> um, sometimes time doesn't really kick in for us, you know, until Monday morning. Do, I, do you want me to repeat that? <laughs> or just go ahead and leave it, move on. Just stay there for a little bit, okay? Just stay there. Just stay there. Just do what I'm doing, okay? You don't have to. That's good. And says, and says, uh, can't hear Jeremy. I said, well, Jeremy's not on <coughs> yet. And, and um, she said, it's okay. It's worth having him up there just for the smile. <laughs> I tell you, you look at somebody smiling. You can, you know, you feel good, right? You look at somebody being all angry and mad. You just get mad too. <laughs> Till we stop living that life. Then all of a sudden you start coming into a life that doesn't matter whether they're smiling or whether they're looking angry. It shouldn't change you. You're already in another realm. You were given a portion of wealth to live in another realm. Whew. I'm going to bring increase. Amen. We're going to have increase. Look, look, in, look, in the, look, here, in the, look here with me in, in, in Matthew um, chapter 13. And just read <coughs> something to you. Very important. Jesus goes to ministering, and you know, disciple. Everybody's standing there looking confused. They're like, "What did he just say?" And so, so disciples came to him. Verse ten, he said, "Why are you speaking in parables?" He answered and said to them, Because it's not been given to them to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them, but it, because it is, is, it is given unto you to know the king, mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not given. He says, First whoever has, to him should be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him, She'll be taken away even that which she has. And now he brings in the application. And he says, in just a minute, listen to this. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. So that hearing, they will not be able to hear. Neither will they be able to understand. So that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Elijah, um, forgive me, by Isaiah, when he said, hearing you should not hear, hearing you should... You hear and should not understand, and seeing you sh shall see and shall not perceive. For the, this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. They were given a measure of wealth, but they wouldn't do anything with it. They were given the privilege of access into the presence of the Lord on a limited degree. 
but still nonetheless an access that brought to them a place of immeasurable blessing. And yet they turned their heart away under their own purposes and under their own desires and under their own ideas and even unto false worship of God. He said, no, I'm not taking it anymore. I'm going to put a judgment upon you and show you that you can't continue with me. I'm, 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 putting a, I'm drawing a line here. You can't continue with me. There's no way that a man on, on this earth is a, able to interact with God unless Father allows us the privilege of interaction with Him. The beautiful thing is He's opened up the door to whosoever will. The beautiful thing is He's poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. Everybody's invited to come. Nobody's left out. But what happens when God's people are unwilling to take what God has given to them and now value it in such a way to where that it begins to multiply and increase? Well, they're going to go backwards. They're not going to go forward. They're going to go backwards. And ultimately, there's going to come a point in time with their eyes will be blinded. They will not be able to move forward. They're not going to be able to hear anymore. They're not going to be able to see anymore. I mean, that's ultimately the place where Father says, and there's no one in here that's that way. That's the place Father says, no more. We're done here. I'm going to turn into another nation. I'm going to turn into, the, I'm going to turn into the, all the nations of the earth, and I'm going to invite them in also. No, not to say that that wasn't Father's plan all along. It was Father's plan all along. It wasn't Father's plan, I don't believe, to exclude in any way. I don't believe in any way it was His choice or His desire to exclude Israel, to bring blindness to Israel, spiritual blindness to Israel. It was their choice. They kept hardening their heart. They kept being unwilling to participate and move forward with the Lord. Now, Let's look at this. Let's look at another dimension of this for just a minute. The reality of it is, is Father has made a way for us to be able to interact with Him, to be able to hear from Him, to be able to know the things that He purposed for us to do. He's put forth His scepter of righteousness towards us, and He's invited us in. So we go and we look in like in a verse of scripture here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And the Lord says in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know what that wisdom is? You know what that hidden wisdom is? That hidden wisdom is that you must be born of the Spirit. That wisdom is that you must receive the gift of life. Free gift of salvation. Huh? That you must be changed. God will give you an opportunity for a brand new beginning. He, be he gives us an opportunity to step into the kingdom. Not based upon any works of righteousness which we have done. Because even the most pure man is, vile, is, is one vile in his presence because of who he is. He gives us a brand new start. He gives us a fresh opportunity. Step over here into his life. Something that could never be earned. And then it's like people begin to walk in it. And they act as though they've earned it. I want to just real quickly. Before I go too much more into this. I want you to just look over here. Just look over here in chapter 4. In verse 7. The Lord says. How can you be puffed up against one another? How can you be thinking these thoughts about yourself? So who, who makes you any different from any other? Who makes you any different from any other? And what do you have right now that you didn't give get as a free gift? What do you have that you didn't receive? The, we, didn't get, we don't get to interact with Father. We don't get to step into this new life. We don't get to enter into the realms of the kingdom of God. 
We don't give this measure of wealth from heaven because of something that we have earned or something that we have deserved. It's because Father in His goodness has opened the door of life to all men and said to every man everywhere, come on in and behold me. But what happens on the other side of things that you then respond to that and you receive what He's given, but it doesn't become the primary thing in your life. It just becomes another thing in your life. In fact, it even becomes something that you prioritize. And when you get around to it, uh-oh, your heart's going to be hardened. Uh-oh. And I, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of folks in that category. Probably here, more people are in the category of just in a bit of a struggle of really accepting just how acceptable you are. How loved you are. You don't earn love with God. Oh, he likes me today. No, he doesn't like me. The daisy Christianity. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Paul just loves unchanging. The, the mercy that bought me, the mer mercy that bought you, the mercy that purchased you is the mercy that keeps you. The mercy that will keep you from falling should you be interested, should you allow God to strengthen you, should you allow God to mature you. Ha, <laughs> Let us say, you have a conscience void of offense before God. This is what Father has purposed. It's wonderful how He's not only the protector, He's also the perfecter. He's not only the provider, He's also the keeper. <laughs> how we begun by this miracle of the new birth, now then to have it based upon what we have the ability to do, or how we. Are we willing to come and recognize, wait a minute, all i got to do is just say, Holy Spirit, come strengthen me. Somebody's telling me the other day, I just don't know how to love them. Okay, well, good. Are you sure? Are you really sure that you don't know? Or are you just pretending? You're just telling me that. No, I don't know how to love them. I'm telling you, I'm sure about it. Okay, well, good. Now, you know what you're supposed to do? Love them anyways? No. Take another guess. There's a few other guesses. Good, yeah. You're supposed to now have a reaction to God, have a relationship with Him, an interaction with Him, and say, Holy Spirit, fill me with this love that you've come and brought from heaven for me. And watch what will happen. Now, this is a shift where all of a sudden you're going to begin to have a relationship with the Lord where you ask and He gives, and you're not asking, oh, God, put a million dollars in my bank account. You don't need a million dollars in your bank account. It will make you worse than you are now. It make you more problematic. You know, oh God, fix this! Oh God, fix that! People are saying, "Oh, if I could just have this other thing, I wouldn't have this problem. If I could just get to that place, I wouldn't have this issue in my life." No, you're gonna still have the same problem when you get whatever it is that you think you need. It's just gonna be worse because nothing material. Nothing within the natural framework of things is going to fix you. Oh, yeah, but I can see it. It will be a substitute. No, it won't. Demons don't leave because you finally got what you, need, you thought you needed. <laughs> they stay around and they get amplified. But what happens when we begin to quit asking a fantasy, something that we can consume in our own interest? In our own lust, oh, if I only had this, or if I could only do this, or if I could only accomplish this, or if I only could be this, I'd feel better about myself, and I wouldn't be tormented so much. Yes, you would. You'd be tormented more. Because when you get that, you're just going to have more problems. The more stuff you have, the more problems you have. Are you listening to me? <laughs> the Father wants to freely give to us. Father would like to make you wealthy and add no sorrow to it because it's God that ga gave you the power to make wealth. And, but that's never going to happen until you recognize, no, it's just Him. He's done it. It has nothing to do with me. It's His. It doesn't even belong to me. People basically live their life holding on to their own self and everything about their self. It belongs to me. It's mine. You can't have it. Get away. You can't have it. It's mine. I can't believe it. That person wanted what was mine. The Lord said, if you have a coat, if you have a shirt, 
and, and someone asks you for your shirt, give them your shirt and give them your coat also. Go ahead and double bless them. Oh, that's my shirt. It's the only shirt I have. You need to go earn your shirt. I earned my shirt. The Lord said, no, 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 no. I don't, want you to, I don't even want you to live that way. I don't need, it's not yours anyways. I gave it to you. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's nothing that belongs to me. I, everything that I have, Father gave it to me. How can I act like that what I have I didn't receive from him? How many things do you have in your life that you feel like somehow you earned it? It's yours. It's your position. It's your stuff. It's your things. It's your idea. Don't forget it was my idea. <laughs> You're cutting God out of completely out of the picture out of your life. Don't forget, I did that. Oh, well, we won't. Here, let's make a special note. It's just holding on to self. It's just so insecure. It's fear. It's living in a fear. To be able to just step away from that and say, okay, maybe you're living in a fear. And you can say, Father, I'm living in this fear of torment. I'm so insecure. I've got to try to get blow my horn before me everywhere I go. Do, 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 do. Look at what I am. Do, 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 do. Look at what I'm doing. I'm so insecure. They won't like me. Do, do, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, Lord, fill me with your love. Fill me with your confidence. Fill me with your boldness. Open up my eyes and cause me to see. There's something going on. There's things that are going on in the realms of the spirit. Go back to verse 2. There's things that are going on in the realm of our interaction with God that are absolutely essential for us to be able to get how to walk this life with God, how to live out this life with God. And he says it to us right here. He tells us in verse 9 of chapter 2, is written, eyes not seen. The Lord said, I am going to show you the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to unveil to you the realm of a brand new start. I'm going to show you the blessings of how you lose your life, that you may find it. Everyone who finds his own life will lose it forever. Everyone that loses his life in this world She'll find it forever. I'm going to show you how to have the things that I want to give you. I want to show you how to have the things that belong to my interest. But you've got to voluntarily push your interest and what's important to you in this life out of the way. In fact, I'll, I'll, if you'll take the first step in obedience to me and honor me, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you more. Insight and revelation, by and large, from heaven is a direct result of our obeying Him, of our obedience to Him. We want God, oh, Lord, show me more. Well, obey first. Do what I told you to do. Oh, Lord, I just want to walk in a greater compassion. I want to love your husband. And then we'll work on somebody else next. I mean, could you imagine... That a husband and a wife get married and they got to spend their whole existence learning how to love one another? My goodness. They can't even move on. They can't even move forward. They can't move forward because they've just not been willing to just submit to the Holy Ghost who would have taught them, you know, in a short order, the principles of love. Does that mean that you're not going to have to deal with issues? No, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to deal with issues. It's just now you know how to deal with them. Now you know how to take it and shove it off to the side. Say, so, no, I don't act that way. No, I don't respond like that. No, I don't think that way. Holy Spirit, come. Strengthen me. Come feel me. Come give me the ability to live this life that you supply to me. You've given to me a portion of wealth, one portion of wealth. Some people, the Lord, it's almost like at start, he gave them five portions of wealth. That's pretty intense. God knows the hearts of all men. Is it going to allow us to be tempted above what we're able? God gives a portion. If God gave a person a, a five portions of wealth, he saw within them a willingness to run and move and go like no one else he could find. Does it mean to say that the person that God gave one measure of wealth too in the kingdom of God can't ultimately increase to having the five or having even more. 
It's just the Lord's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able. Maybe he just looks at you and sees you lazy. Are you uh, stubborn? Or you you interested in other things? And he sees it's going to take me half his lifetime or half her lifetime to get her to a point where she's, she or he's not interested in all this other stuff. So therefore, I'm going to give him one measure of wealth. What is that measure of wealth? How, how important, how beautiful, how awesome is this miracle of salvation that God has given to you? This right of access into his presence. Because that's the kingdom. That's what these things, this, what, this is what the Lord has declared. Huh. This, is what, this is what he has made known that is above every other thing. This new start with him. This ability to be able to see what I has not seen. This ability to hear what ears not heard. This ability to have brought into our hearts by God the Holy Ghost that which ne man has never even thought of before and which the Holy Spirit himself is revealing to us. He says, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to tell you right now, everyone who's been born of the Spirit, everyone who's responded to the Lord Jesus Christ, has been given this privilege to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But it's step number one. It's obedience number one. It's, it's your willingness to say, okay, this is what you've called me to do. Father, I'm going to do it with all my heart. I'm going to, va I'll value this. I want to value this. You've, you know, at the beginning of our salvation, the Lord put a whole lot of value in our spirit and in our heart about this wonderful new life that we have in Him. And somewhere along the way, many people's first love diminishes. Somewhere along the way, people become interested. They become fashionable, in, as it were, in the church. Now they begin to start doing things more religiously, more out of just a response to men's expectations and their own expectations and religious expectations rather than a reality of I am now interacting with God. I, I have this privilege, this access. I mean, when you, come to, when you come to cherish what God has given to you and you don't allow it, allow it, to become something that is not relevant to your life or not important in your life. It doesn't become relevant and not important to your life because you don't use it. There's really hardly a way to even give an example of, of that because there's nothing in, can compare to what Father has privileged us to have in Him. It's just that what has happened within the framework of our life and the way we do things, the way God does things just don't fit in. It's not practical. And this is the problem. He wants to make faith very practical. He wants to make flowing and operating in the realms of the Holy Ghost, the heavenly realm, very practical and applicable to our life. We're so focused on the fact that we've got to run to work in the morning to meet the bills. We're so, we're so focused on that. And when you get focused on that, when you get trapped on that, you can't have the kingdom. You can't have it. It was given and you know the mysteries of the kingdom, but you didn't obey. He said, don't be concerned about your food. People are concerned all the time. Don't be concerned. I mean, you know, I... You usually will say, take no thought. Reality of it is, the word is more perfectly expressed than just the, using the English word concern. Don't be concerned. It changes the whole approach to it all. Now you're not all wrapped around it. Now you're not living your life for yourself in this world, responding to the pressures and the demands placed upon you in a, in a kingdom of darkness, a place that is opposite of where Father wants to lead us, a place that is d completely opposite from the gift, the measure, that one portion of wealth that was given to us to now be able to learn how to live in this heavenly realm. So Father gives us these basic principles in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 7 so that we can understand how now to live in a whole other realm. He says... 
Forsake all the things that have been placed upon you. There are meaning for you. Come and follow me. I'm going to show you another way. I'm going to show you the entrance into the kingdom. We can't. We don't. We're strapped down. We're locked down. Well, I got this. I got that. I got to do that thing and the other thing. And people won't like me if I don't or whatever. I'll be a failure to my parents. A disappointment to my friends. Well, you got to hate. You got to learn how to hate your life in this world. Now, that is a paradox for most people. That you talk about a parable, rather, you know. And and, and it's a paradox too. But it, I mean, talk about a parable. How on earth can you hate your life in this world? What's God saying? He said, "I want to show you so such something, so much better than what you've been doing and how you've been living that you would just despise it, hate it, would never want to go back to that." But it's going to take, it's going to take leaving where you've been comfortable living. You've got to leave where you've been comfortable living. You've got to leave where all your influences are. All the people think you're so special and important. Go over to where someplace, what, to a place where people want to just kill you. <laughs> they just hate you at the very sight of you. They don't know you, they just hate you. You've got to go over where people don't like you. Where you've never been before. Where you're not comfortable. Where you don't have anything but God. It's true. That's what happened with Abraham. He said, I want you to leave the place where you were born, the place of your family, the place of your security, the place of, of, of your fame and of your fortune and of your future. And I want you to come out alone with me into a place that I will show you. I want you to be a separate one. That's what Hebrew means. Ivrit means. I want you to be so separate from everyone else, it's like crossing on the other side of the river away from humanity. To be evrit, to be separated. God's called us to be separated. Separated in what? Separated unto him. Not separated from everybody else so we dress up in what? White gowns with pink spots? Huh? And wear little crowns with stars in it? No. I mean, we just go on all these kind of, I mean, obviously that's swinging the pinch some people go, but I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of things going on that looks a whole lot like that. And that's supposed to be separate from the world? That ain't separate from the world. You're just weird. You just, all you've done is just made it just that much more problematic. God wants us to be separate unto a realm, a heavenly realm that everybody looks at and goes, Whoa! Like, like the Queen of Sheba did when she saw the glory realm that Solomon was privileged to be separate. God gave him a, a portion, five portions. I don't know how much you would measure that. Let's just say it's five portions of wealth so that he could show forth that separateness, that glory, that blessing that only belongs to the people of the Lord. Well, I must not be a people of the Lord because I'm just not blessed. That's your problem. You're going to have to accept the blessing of God that has been extended to all men. Quit living in a realm tossed about by doubt and unbelief. That's why their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened because they wouldn't allow the word to be mixed with faith. Their hearts were hardened because of constant murmur and complaint. They wouldn't believe what was told them. Well, where is the land? I'd rather be in leeks, have leeks and garlics. Were there not enough graves? In Egypt, that it must bring us out here to bury us. Or was really, was there not enough room for a grave for all of us in Egypt? So that we need to be brought out to. The... What a relationship. What a wrong perspective of who God is. You know, it's a wonderful thing when you start living like a little child. Huh? You know, I'm not responsible for the bills. I am learning in God. How to be able to manage greater wealth. Not responsible for the bills. That's not doing me. Got a problem with the way I manage bills? Talk to Papa. I'm not responsible. I'm just doing what he's telling me to do. Hmm? The more we move in faith, the more we have a company of people who move in faith with us, the greater that increase comes. The greater that financial ability, spiritual ability and, of course, the Lord says, he measures it like this. He says, if you can't be faithful with unrighteous mammon, how can you be faithful with the true riches? I've given you a measure. If you'll, be, if you'll go ahead and be faithful with the measure, that which you've been given, you're going to have an increase. More will be given to you. 
God's come to show you things that has never entered into the hearts of men. God's come to reveal the secrets of, of the ages to you. He's come to empower you to live in a realm of glory that you can't even imagine. But you're going to have to first be obedient with the first thing. And open your mouth and say, thank you, Lord, I'm alive in you. And until you can do that on a consistent basis, until you're willing just to embrace this whole beautiful privilege of I no longer live, it's Jesus that lives. Well, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. Then you're not, you know, God will give you an assurance of salvation. The more you, di the more you dabble in, an, in, in the realm of not being sure, uh-oh, you better watch out. If I say to you, do you know you're right with God? Do you know you're on, on your way to heaven? Do you know that your name is written in the book of life? And you say, yes, I know for certain. Then therefore, you also know that you no longer live. It's Christ that lives. And then now all of a sudden, you've got all these measures, these performance measures that you placed on yourself. So now you're not sure, certain. Now you're starting to stagger. Wait a minute, the other's in the unseen realm, and it's all based upon the goodness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. But now you're starting to tell me that I no longer live as Christ lives. Now that's in the seen realm, and now I've got various different measures that I've placed upon that, and so now I'm starting to backpedal or back row or whatever. Huh? Uh-oh. No, the same one that wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and is... And is made that all, worked all of that out, is the same one that has given you this gift that of Christ Jesus living in you, who is now training you and teaching you. And until you begin to learn or, or until you begin to embrace it, then you're never able to move forward because we go teaching every man and warning every man so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And this is how we do it, by telling every man the mystery of the fellowship. Christ is in you. And you're not going to move forward until you embrace this. You're going to have to receive freely this gift. Now, what happens when you begin to receive freely this gift? You become overwhelmed at the measure of the grace that has been given to you. That you stand in His presence just as Christ Jesus is there in His presence. That you receive this free gift of righteousness. That you receive this free gift of holiness. For on the measure of man's own righteousness, there would be no, you would be damned. On the measure of man's own holiness, there's no one would be saved. Listen to me. You're going to have to get out of you and get into him. And as soon as you do, you'll, you, you'll begin to deal with it and learn how to put down a defiled conscience. You'll, be learning, you'll learn how to be able to deal with properly condemnation, an overwhelming sense of failure. You'll be able to recognize it for what it is. It's purely demonic. That's not even self. That's just purely demonic. It keeps you back. From being able to have increase with that which Father has provided you with. Can you come into the presence of the Lord with condemnation? You can't. Come in with all boldness. Having been washed of condemnation. Having been washed in the blood of Jesus. He's giving you a measure of wealth to come into his presence to interact with him. Huh? You're going to have to quit with the falsehoods and get into the truth. You're going to have to quit with just to pretend, just the outward observance of things, just the outward activity. Well, it's Sunday. We're going to now interact with God. Well, that's good that people would say that and would do that. That's, you know, honorable or whatnot. But look, I mean, you got to, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be, wait a minute, I've got a treasure. I've been given wealth. I've been given masaterinea. Ooh, an apolosatea prokatai. An opportunity to know him. Hallelujah. Manzeze kurastaya. I've been given nambruvaya sito. I've been given a privilege of saying just and, and being really relaxed about it, not being all tint. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh no. I gotta have your demeanor. I've got to shine like a light. Oh God. Oh God. I, I pray. I have peace expressions on my face when I walk into work today. Ah. And you're all worked up about it. Just doubt and unbelief prayers. I mean, I think too many people live in that kind of relationship, of this obligation. It's not an obligation. The actions of love and the reactions of love are not an obligation. God was not obligated. I hear people saying, you obligated. He's not obligated to nothing. 
You're obligated to give me a kiss right now. Okay. <laughs> obligated. It's not, not obligation. You even want to try to put it in the framework of profane covenants. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. There's a far greater realm that Father would love to introduce us to. It's a realm of His love and His purity and His gentleness. And the only way we can even begin to understand it is servitude and, and being childlike because we have no other means be, to be even, even be able to relate to what it is He's trying to tell us. And we're never going to understand until we walk in it. I just pray every one of you quit being grown up. Stop from this day on. Stop being grown ups. Huh? Quit acting so grown up. Stop being so responsible for your life. So responsible for your families. And for your stuff. The Lord told you to live a carefree life. He says, don't be concerned about it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not concerned about it. Well, I demand you to be concerned. You can demand all you want. I'm not serving you. I'm serving him. You can give me whatever looks you want. You can give me whatever pressure you want. You can say whatever bad thing you want to say. You can pull whatever string that makes everybody else dance. Ain't going to work on me. Ain't no strings attached to me. They all been cut. I'm nobody's puppet. I belong purely to him. I'm not coming under social pressures of men or social pressures of society or culture. Huh? I'm coming as a slave to Jesus Christ. I have one commander in chief. I have one almighty God who rules me. He says, why do you tell me? He says, don't be concerned. Let's don't, I don't care what they say. Don't be concerned. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I, I don't care what they say. Don't be concerned. Because as long as you're concerned, you're going to dig yourself into a deeper ditch of a place where you will not, seeing you will not see, hearing you should not hear, nor will you be able to understand that which God has purposed. To come and freely give to everyone, every person, all flesh, leaving nobody out. The door's open. He says to everybody, come on in. Peace. There's a place of fellowship with me. It's got to be more than a song. A song's got to come as an, a reaction to his action because you're interacting with him. And in an interaction with him, you see him. There's an action there before you, an event, a display of the power of God. Sometimes as a display of the power of God, just the way his word stands up and shakes me. Sometimes it's just, there's really, like I was saying, it's just, there's really nothing other than this place of walking this out, this deeper relationship with him. You step in, it's to the ankles. You go on with him, just keep walking with him. Staying in the river, it's knee deep. Just keep walking with him, staying in the river. Huh. Waist deep. Huh. Now you got to swim because there's no place to stand. Uh, and I'm telling you right now, when you're swimming, it's still getting deeper. Amen. And it's a place. It's a, it's, it's, it's a realm. It's a, it's a, it's where, where no, there can be no rudder. No rudder. You can't have a rudder on this, on this river, on this sea. The prophet said, no rudder. No sail. It's steered by the power of God. you just on board, heading in the direction that he's purposed, that he, of course, which he said, and you're just so happy. You're going to your favorite choice, his choice. You're going to the destiny that you chose, that one that he chose. And you're so excited, so overwhelmed by it. Because every day of walking out with him, suddenly, you, you know, every day is a suddenly. Every day you're able to see more of this grace, more of this love, more of the splendor. Though your beginnings are small, your latter end shall be great. It shall be greatly, great, greatly increased. We come into this life having nothing, knowing nothing, being nothing, determined and destined by God to rule and reign with Him forever. Should we give ourselves to learning how to live and walk in this treasure that we've received in these earthen vessels? Should we give ourselves to saying a choice that every human being, every man alive, 
right now has. Will I choose life and live? Will I make the choice to learn the ways of God and walk with Him in His, in his life? Or am I going to choose that which others have chosen in the past to live my own life, to do it my own way? To satisfy all the craving desires that I might have. That's the difference. That's what's going on. God gave us a treasure to choose life and live. Many people have received this treasure. And they've just basically done everything opposite what God said. Except for, in some cases, come to church on Sunday morning. Or maybe Saturday morning. Some people come to church on Saturday morning. Because they think we're a bunch of heathens coming to church on Sunday morning. Huh? And we're the church singing, will there be any stars in my crown? And they're the same church that's singing, no, 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 not one. No, not one. <laughs> it's true. It's just, that's the way it comes down. And people are all just in the big debate and the big argument. Forget about it. It's time for the light to shine. It's time for somebody to come to know God. It's about to stop driving. For someone to make increase of that which God has given to us. <laughs> it's a choice of our will. Somebody said, I need something. You don't need anything. Oh, I do. No, you don't know. You walk it in your own wisdom. You walk it in your own revelation. I'm walking in what God said. I'm not, I'm not declaring to you that which I believe. I'm declaring to you that which God has spoken. I'm declaring to you how God has set it up. Father is going to teach you to love everybody passionately, even though all the world hates you. Don't want to learn? You want it the other way around? Ain't going to work out. God is going to teach you to trust him for everything when you don't have a cent. You don't like that? It ain't going to work out. God is going to teach you to rely on not one single dimension of what you believe you know and can do. But to fully rely only upon him to set all that aside. Paul got it. He had, an, he, had an, he had an interaction. The action, he beheld God. I mean, he got, he, he, come on now. The Lord gave him, Father gave him five measures of wealth. Huh? Father saw in him someone who was going to run and not let up. He saw in him that passion, that zeal that he had. It was a true zeal. It was a true passion. He said, okay, I'm going to give you five measures of wealth. Here, he has an encounter with the Lord. And he, my, my, my. And grace was not bestowed upon him in vain. Ha, huh, listen to that, hear that? And the grace of God was not given to me with, for nothing. Because I labored more than they all. But not me, Christ that's in me. Why? God saw that he would say, everything that I've known, everything that I've had, everything I've come to rely upon, everything that has been valuable and meaning to me, Meaningful to me is nothing more than dung. It's poop. People say, please stick with dung. Please. It is sanctified among our ears. I, I, would, I would hope that it's truly that way. That that's the way it is in your living room when you're watching television. Huh? And anywhere else. Amen. Hallelujah. That you don't even want anything beyond the dung. <laughs> Have you gotten there yet? Have you been willing to let God take you there yet? Are you, did, did the Lord give you a measure of wealth and you're standing there just loving on Him, just so blessed, and then you just sit down? And you've been saying, How long are you going to sit there? I think some people have been sitting there for about 15, 20 years, just sitting there. I surrender all. I surrender all. Then I can feel some of you just passionate. Okay, I'll do anything. You don't have to go anywhere to do anything. You can do anything, right? Anything. Now you're willing to do anything, you can do it right where you're sitting. Hallelujah. Uh, it's a change, it's a change, and it's, listen to me. I tell people this all the time. I have people come in and just make boastful statements. Oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. I'm, and I look at them and go, no, you're not. You want to do it. 
Oh, I'll do it. I'm going to prove it. And then I can just see it. You know, I'm provoking the good work. And I'm like, I, I, you're not going to do it. And they said, well, how do you know? You're not, you're, I'm not going to do it. Because your life has proven to me you won't do it in the future. Because now you're going to tell me you're going to be different than you've been all the way up to this, all this time that you've been saved. Now you're going to tell me that you're going to be different. You're not. You're going to be exactly how you've always been until you recognize you need to change. And you're not at that point yet. You're not at that crisis yet. And unfortunately, every time I've had this encounter with people, they don't, they don't say to me the most important salient point. What crisis do I need? What brings me to that point? It's just like they walk out. You can hear it. It's like loud. Well, you just wait and see. <laughs> and I don't know. I can already predict the future. It's, oh, he cursed me. He cursed me. You know. I, no, I blessed him. I, I'm just trying to help the persons or people understand that this is a radical commitment to different, to different. And as long as I'm relying on myself, I'll never be different. But if I solely abandon all that I have relied upon and say, now, I'm not going to be concerned no more. I'm casting, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about nothing. Try that on for one week. No, two hands for beginners. For five hours. Oh, okay. Then work towards one day, one day. And then five, not five hours on vacation paid. <laughs> One day. I'm worried about nothing. I'm concerned about nothing. And I'm casting all my concerns upon him. Because he's, I'm in his care. And he's faithful who promised. Huh? Try this on. Try this. Well, what's going to happen to you? You're going to begin to deal with your intimidation, your fear. You're going to begin to deal with the literal four walls. You're going to actually measure out the four walls of the cell you are living in. You're going to get the very breadth and length of that cell you've been living in. Huh? That's the realm that you've been confined in. You're going to go, oh, wow, I didn't know I was in this little area. Then you can begin to cry out to God and give thanks. You have a bust out. I don't want to live in this place no more. I, would you be willing to lose everything for the price, for the purpose of not being concerned about anything? Would you be willing to lose everything at the expense of simple obedience? Uh-oh. Come on now. Come on now, listen to me. Don't get sad about this. Cause that, you, you, sad, mad, or glad? Glad because you've been here. You've heard the good news. Sad because you've heard it and aren't going to do it. Anytime I'm preaching and I see people get sad, they the rich man talking to Jesus who went away sad because they were not willing to do it. Don't get sad on me because I'm going to get a word of knowledge about you. You guys, God has already laid out for us how this works. We know who the religious people are. They mad at us. You need to get happy about this. Oh, no, I'm really... Because the manifestation of concern and worry and won't let go. No, I'm staying right here. We take those to the slaughterhouse. I'm going to say that. You take those to the slaughterhouse. They're not workable. That's what the Word of God says. Fit for the slaughter. That's what the Lord of the Lord says. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. God has called you, I'm sorry to tell you, to live in heaven. I'm sorry to tell you God has called you to live a worry-free, care-free, abundant life that you've received from heaven, and Father's the one who's provided for you according to his riches and glory. Yeah. By Christ Jesus. True. To live out a life so freely given to us that we need never have a sense of sin, a conscience of sin, a condemnation anymore, for we've been given the free gift of righteousness and holiness and acceptance in the beloved. And the one who called us is also faithful. Also to establish us. He who began a good work shall also perfect it or complete it. I mean, to get locked down into hell, this is amazing grace. How sweet the sound. 
I mean, it becomes a living expression that causes you to shout in the most the most intense crisis that causes you to rejoice when everything looks like it's going against you because you've been persuaded. Not out of religion. It won't persuade you. But out of interaction with him. Out of relationship with him. Out of learning how to react to that which he does. His word is an action for me that I must react to. His word is a challenge to me. Every word is a challenge to me. Every word is a question to me. Every word I hear Father saying to me, Son, are you willing to do it yet? Are you willing? Come on. I want to use you more. Are you willing? Please. Can't you just trust me a little? Here, just a little. Can't you just let go of your, of your stuff, of your boo? Of your little security blankets? Can't you let go of your own life? Your own life. Your own life. You must lose it. I just I want to read that. I, I wrote those few verses of scripture down because I want to read them to you. It's found there in um, Matthew. Back one, two chapters, Matthew 10. Of course, I quoted it. I just want to read to you. In this context, Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. How many of you understand God's not call, calling you to, to, to poverty and misery? Now, if God was calling us to poverty, pos, to call, call, call us to poverty misery, suffering, sorrow, and depression, I can understand the reluctance. <laughs> he's not he's calling us to an abundant life he's calling us to a provision that goes beyond what you can provide for yourself I'm telling you right now he's calling us to a glory a beauty a splendor where there is not one little teeny drop of need left in you and all you got is him Everything that makes you full, so full that you are so complete that you have need of nothing more, that you are so full that rivers of his glory is pouring out of you, is all found in him. This is the breakthrough. And I'm telling you, listen to me. You live in a culture of darkness. You live in a realm of deception and deceit that have made a pr high price on a, a, a premium on things that are valueless, meaningless. If you ring in your house and worried over the house, uh, ring in your hands and worried over the house that you're living in, I, I just recommend you go get a tent. Move into your car. Unfortunately, you won't learn nothing there either. Huh? You have to turn it over to him. All it is is you're just going to, all you're going to do is create, is basically transfer the problem that you have in your relationship with God from one situation to another situation. That's all you're going to do. Because it's a matter of the heart. To you is given the privilege, the rights. To know the mysteries of the kingdom. To know, in other words, what only the Holy Spirit can teach. To know what, in other words, what eyes never seen, ears never heard before. To, ha to know the things concerning God's love that he would bring us into such a place. <laughs> well, people make decisions all the time. And, you know, the Lord just dealt with me about this real strong this past week. Of where he showed me where I've been making decisions like this. Where I make decisions to limit him. He said, no, 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 don't do it that way. You're doing it that way because you see the framework. You live in an, I'm, see, I live in the framework. I've lived in a framework of, of where my faith operates. And if you're not careful, you can get comfortable with that. So within the way my faith operates, well, I can do it. I don't have anybody else to do it. Well, you know what? You could go hire the, the person to do it. And believe me for the finances. But I don't operate that way. I have found a faith. I got a faith realm to do things 
I've grown into a faith realm to do things the way I'm doing them, okay? And the Lord says, why you put a threshold? Why you limit it there? Stop. And I go, okay. Because the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm not going to bless it. I won't bless you no more in it. Because I'm tired of it. It pleased him before. It, it was the promotion before, but he's tired of it now. Because he's got, he's got things he's got to watch me get done. You understand? And if I keep operating the same way I'm operating, I can't get it done. He says, no, I want you to believe in another dimension. I want you to believe in another. I want you to take your faith. And I want you to put it over here now in a place that's not comfortable for you. And if you will do it, I'll, then I'll meet you there and I'll enlarge you. Because I said, okay, Lord, I, I, don't, I know how. You've taught me now, Lord, how to move in faith. I know when that gift of faith comes. I know where it is. I understand it. Because then I'm confident. I can move out. It can be beyond the, the realms of anything that we have the resources or the ability to do. But I can feel it. I know it. I understand it. And then I can move in it. And then the Lord says, no, now that's fine. That was good for last year. That was good. And in fact, I've actually been living in the past 10, 10 years, almost a decade. And, and the Lord's, it takes, well, you know, I'm a little slow. And I want to quit being slow. And I'm, but, but you know what? Did you know that you got the control of slow? You're holding slow. The Lord says, speed this thing up. I'm scared. Huh? Because when you're going slow, you can still bail out. Right? You slam that thing to the, the firewall, man. You're going so fast, you can't. You just, hang on. A friend of mine who God had just given him a gift of faith. He said that I told another gift of faith. He was going through this transition. And he called me up and he says, man, he said, last night I had a dream. And the dream describes exactly like I feel. He said, I was out on the very tip of the wing of the airplane. And it was not just taxing the wheels at all. It was lifting off the ground. And all I was hanging on to that smooth part on the wing. Are you ready? Are you listening to me? Are you ready for that? You're not in the plane. You're out on the tip of the wing. And you're not just kind of taxing slow coming out of the dock area. The wheels have just left the ground. Woo! Can you get comfortable with that? <laughs> Woo! I said, that's actually what the Lord put in my mouth. The word the Lord put in my mouth. That's it. I said, can you get comfortable with that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Kupa shara mataya pakora mai. Now, the beautiful thing of it is, is the Father describes in His Word exactly those things that we are supposed to do, where we are supposed to react to for this particular time, for every time that we're in, for every transition we're in, for every place of growth we're in, for every realm of maturity we're in. Most of the time, the Lord is just, we could have grown a lot quicker because the Lord was saying it over and over again to us, but we weren't willing to, we weren't willing to put it into practice. We weren't willing to participate. We weren't willing to step out and make it part of life. It's too uncomfortable. We couldn't see how to do it. Well, we wrestled with it a little bit. We thought it through. Problem. If you think things through with God, forget about it. Because you ain't ever going to think through what he, impossible things he's told you to do. But let's think through. God told us to walk on the water. Now let's think this through. We can't do that. Yeah. Let's think this through. God told us to raise the dead. Now, they had a heart attack. <clears throat> and uh, and a brain hemorrhage. And uh, let's see what all is going to have to be. Every cell in their body is dead now. And it just keeps getting bigger. Jesus made it smaller. Ah, oh, she's not dead. She's sleeping. He made it smaller. We make it bigger. We make it more. In our intellectual process, we make it more difficult. He makes it more simple. He pairs it down to what it really is. We make it what it really is. <laughs> what we perceive it to be within the framework of our limitations of our beginnings and our ends. Father wants to teach us a whole new way of thinking. That's going to be, that's challenging. You've got to be committed to this. You know how the first step? I no longer live as Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm not in the earth. Jesus said, he said, they are clean. Through the word which I have spoken unto them. Hmm. They are not of this world. Even as I am not of this world. With all, they, and you could say Peter's only ankle deep. Or knee deep. 
Still, listen to what Jesus is saying. With all the problems, Thomas like, I'm not believing nothing until I put my fingers into his. They are clean. They are heavenly. They are of divine blood. Listen to him. Not of this world, even as I'm not of this world. You need to start thinking different about yourself. You need to get out of your rules and regulation and get into relationship with him. You need to get out of your, uh, of your obligation and get in to the participation, the reaction, the relationship of it all. The privilege to do it. The Lord says, whatever you ask me, I'll do it. Why? Because I love you. Look at you guys. You, you, if your sons ask for you, ask you for a, a, a piece of bread, you'd never give them a stone. And how much more? How much, what, how much better am I going to take care of you when you ask me for something? Okay, Lord, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm all here. I'm going to hang on everything I got. You go first. <laughs> he can't go first. Because what, uh, what he wants to give us only works when we let go of everything. That's the only time it's noticeable. In fact, everything we're holding on to over here and all scared and intimidated about not letting go of, he gave it to us anyways. Because we came into this world knowing nothing, having nothing. By the miracle of his divine will and grace. And then we act like we got here on our own. Huh? And we just, oh, we'll take it from here. <laughs> Can one sparrow fall from the heavens, from the sky, and fall but not take note of it? You're more valuable than many sparrows to me, the Lord says. God gave us this very small beginning, this beginning, of, this moment of time where we began with a destiny, a call to come into a place of ruling and reigning with him and his divine power and glory throughout the ages. And this is the simplest thing, the most fundamental thing, and we don't get it. We're, we're stuck right now at whatever age you are. I'm 56. I'm just 56. I better not be living for who I am in this world. And at 56, I better not be living whatever age you are, whatever thing you're doing, whatever thing you've got going on, because it's going to come into an end, in, 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 an abrupt end, a screaming halt. You living with a divine privilege and opportunity to be taught the ways of the living God, that which Satan walked away from, that which the my, many mighty angels walked away from, that which many men have refused to lay hold on. And if opted out of, God's giving you an opportunity to say, okay, I'll be taught of you. I want to learn to do it your way. What will you do? Huh. I'm, I just challenge you right now to grab a hold of his life, to be persuaded of it. And get passionate about it. I, I, I pray today that you be that you be given over to love and compassion. And I, I pray today you be given over to the shouts of joy. I pray today that you'll be given over to a place of living out a relationship with him in such a way that you could be in a in a in a in a in a terrible place as I was this past week. <laughs> and have a visitation from heaven just because the Lord takes and removes out of the way. Every sense of doubt to know with absolute certainty that he's listening to every word that's coming out of your mouth and he's standing before you. Who is man that he's mindful of? Son of man that he visits him. Oh, when our value and the meaning of our life suddenly gets turned to truth suddenly begins to be measured by the purpose of God, what he's, what he's elected and called us to be in him, to which he's so unwilling to live without it. He spared no expense but sent Jesus to secure our place, to break off the yoke. I'm going to tell you right now, unless a man is born again, unless a man 
turns all of his trust towards Christ Jesus, relying only in that which the blood can do, he's, he's, there's no way. He's lost forever. It's darkness forever. No matter how good they are, no matter what they pretend to be or look to be, they're lost forever. It's impossible without Christ Jesus to please God. It's impossible. There's no other name given under heaven where men by men can be delivered. God came, the King of heaven, the glory of heaven came proclaiming this everlasting gospel to you and me. If we should value it less than our food, how could we be worthy of it? If we should value it less than the securities of our bank account and the things that we hold dear in this life, which perishes with the using, thieves will break through and steal. Moth and rust will destroy it, consume it. And we value him less than that. How could we ever be worthy of it? When all the time God gave to us the ability to perceive. He gave to us the right to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To be able to look in and see what eyes not seen, ears not heard. Never has they entered in the heart of men. These things which God has purposed for them who love him which is now revealed to us and revealing to us by the Holy Spirit. Should we be less than fully passionate with all of our life? How could we be worthy of it? How would we ever be able to move forward in it? Because God's not going to play pretend. He's the spirit of truth. He's not going to go ahead and interact with the lie and cause us to grow and develop in some kind of a lie and falsehood wherever we di divert from truth. There's people with a measure, that one measure, that is referred to by Jesus in Matthew 25 of wealth. Who just stopped at the introduction to this abundant life and never participated with it. There's people who were given that five, as it were, measures of wealth who operate in that five measures of wealth to some degree, even as the person who received the one measure of wealth just more or less just kind of operates in the ritual of salvation. You know what I'm saying? They never move forward. They make no increase. There's even a greater responsibility to the five. What did the, five, the one who was given five make? He doubled it. What happens when the one is given five and he does nothing with it? There's an anointing, there's a grace, there's a divine gifting. Solomon had an anointing, a grace, a divine gift, and look what he did. He perverted it and polluted it. Hey, think about it. Listen, there's only one place of security here, and that is to be, that is to be totally given over to these things of the kingdom of God in a way to where it displays a great passion, where, where it consumes, and it's deserving to consume our every conscious thought. And maybe it starts just like on this level. Lord, I don't understand, but I want to. I, I don't get it, but I want to get it. I don't know how to communicate it, but I want to communicate it. Because it ain't going to take long, and that prayer is going to be answered. So that you can then go ahead and move on to now getting it and enjoying the results, you know, and the fruit of getting it and seeing it and understanding it. Because we know it's his purpose that we get it because unto us has been given to, to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Whew. Whew. Hallelujah. Whew. The Lord comes and visits me. And some of the most amazing situations. It seems like I have been visited by the Lord very consistently in the most humbling situation. 
But in every, situ- every time, I've been in many humbling situations that I was not thankful for. But every humbling situation that I was thankful for, I always got a visitation from the Lord. And some of the most humbling situations got the visitation from the Lord. Because he's really only going to move in that area. We think he's going to come to us in our high and our lofty and our good and our self-conscious and we're so full of ourselves. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that people can be full of themselves? Wow, they're really full of themselves. Have you noticed that? When you're really full of yourself, you don't notice that other people are full of themselves. Huh? It just it seems normal. And it's the right way to say it. The Lord wants us to empty ourselves. God emptied himself. You're going to have to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation to get that one. You're going to have to be able to see what I cannot see. God emptied himself. We call it the kenosis. God emptied himself. Became a servant. You reckon you could? You reckon you could come down off your throne for a minute? You reckon you could come off the throne of your responsibilities and your goals and your issues and your needs and your problems? Could you come on down off that for just a little while? Take on the form of a servant and find out how really how good it is? That you'll begin to discover? Come on. This glorious outpouring of God's divine love in the midst of servitude? Come on. Come here. Come over here. Get over here. Get over here. Quit being sad and sorrowful and disappointed. See Jesus, you'll know you won't be. As long as you see yourself, you'll be sorrowful. You're gonna be you're gonna be tossed. You're, you 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 be careful. You be careful. People all the time getting proof that their house is built upon their own perception of themselves. Because the storm comes and they collapse. Great is the fall of that house. So what are you going to do? I was built on the sand. I must just be built on the sand. <laughs> Get on the rock, men. Get on the rock. It's just God gave you in a moment an opportunity to realize what's really going on here so you can get yourself on the rock. So it's not about you no more. Ha <laughs> ha. Hallelujah. When it's not about you, signs and wonders and miracles will be demonstrated. When it's not about you, you're not going to be intimidated by Satan and hindered from moving in the faith that God has for us to show forth his power and glory in the earth. When it's not about you, Father is fully released to do all that he wants to do. When you're completely out of control, he's totally in control. When you can stand back and just watch what he'll do. Should we form the men in columns? Should we come t- take some kind of military defensive posture and stand? No, just stand here. Let's watch what God will do. Ha <laughs> ha Should we put up our fist to fight? No. Boxti aramana se ti alamanka dea pratusta. Evre besti tu no rapa kaseya. Ha ha bade kaseya prateya. With what do you need that men provide? What amount of treasure that comes out of the realms of that which the arm of flesh can gain so that you may occupy the place that God has freely given. Doesn't it sound reasonable to you that you should abdicate your self-interest? That you should now from this day forward lose your life and no longer hold on to it but rather begin to live for Him? Begin to take a step of faith and prioritize God and seek first the kingdom of God no matter where you're at, no matter where, what you're doing. No longer occupied with the things that will constantly distract you. I've known anointed men of God that all that happened is they didn't find another refrigerator to repair or broken down car to repair or broken down shack to fix. Isn't it example enough of the interference that Satan would run against the interest of heaven. Come on. Listen to me. Listen to me. Bob did not say, be consumed with the concerns of this life. I'm not going to be consumed with them. Ah, well, he, he said the opposite. He didn't tell me go build a house for myself. He told me to get 
busy in the things of the kingdom. Huh? He didn't tell me to get all wrapped up. The Lord tests us out. The Lord will test us out. He'll give us little things. And then see how we become consumed with it. You know, can't you just see him? He wants to bless us. And he, wants to, he says he's going to give us a little treasure. And then we make the treasure more valuable than him. Can you see the hurt it happens to pop? Well, I had the revelation. I saw it. Oh, Father, I'm so, I threw the thing away. I took it, just threw it away. I want nothing to do with it. Father, forgive me. I allowed my heart to be involved for just even a moment. Valuing that thing as important to me as though it was mine, I must retain it. It's yours. It belongs to you. Here, who can I go give it to? How can it offer back right up to you that gave it? That's what Father's looking for. Lord, I'm just looking. I just want to please you. Now, all of a sudden, something's happening in your reaction to his action. <laughs> that is going to allow you now to move forward in an increase because he's given you something. He gave it to you. You recognize he gave it to you. Now you value it within that perspective. And now he increases more. You take it and you hold on to it. and You wrap your feet around it. And your hands around it. Mine! And it becomes... Well, Satan will quickly make sure that it becomes such a distraction that it will consume your every waking hour if he can make it that way. You will soon not have time for church, barely time for ministry. We busy building our stuff, taking care of our stuff, counting our money. What are you doing? Why are we all here counting our money? You take care of your money, your money take care of you. No. Wealthy people will do that. Iron their money. Make sure there's no wrinkles. Lay it all out there, wrap it up in the little thing, wrappers. Get all organized. Get a little treasure. Every so often, bring it out and go through the whole ritual again. It's true. I'm not, this isn't pretend. It's not make believe, I'm telling you. I've been told you take care of your money, your money take care of you. Well, at least he knew that. At least he knew what he was doing, eh? And he served mammon. And mammon rewarded him. Some people serve mammon and get nothing. He served mammon. He went all the way with his God. Well, he was supposedly a Christian. But he made several million dollars back in that day, back in the 80s. This one person comes to mind. He's worth millions, literally millions, all of his assets. That his children's now inherited. And he's dead. And he's gone. And I wonder if his money's taking care of him. I say it's not. Money's not taking care of him. Can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God in your own interest. He loves you. He's given you a treasure. He's given you one measure of wealth. It's his gift. To you, to us. What are we going to do with it? We've got to be careful. Because if we're, not, if we're not careful, we'll take it and we'll serve mammon with it. We'll hide it in the earth. And it will never increase. The Lord gave us something. He gave us the treasure of the new birth. He gave us the access and the privilege to know him in a way that words just fine to express it. And with that, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is right here, right now. With that, the Holy Ghost is here right now to cause us to see, cause us to understand. All we have to do is begin to say, I want to see we don't have to get down on, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm just sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> to get up and just go live the same way. We say, Holy Spirit. Because, see, we, we sorry. Yeah, we are. And we never will be much more than that. 
But God in our sorry state, hallelujah, came and made us something far more than we can ever imagine in Christ Jesus. So now instead of getting down in our religious little posture, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We can now say, Holy Spirit, come strengthen me. Come fill me. Come help me. Come give me this ability. Show me how to move with you. Not to be a forgetful here. Now we're going to go somewhere because we're doing the right thing, asking the right person. Moving in faith. Instead of just being sorry. It's okay if somebody wants to get down and say, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry for themselves for a while. So long as at the end of it they say, Holy Spirit, now come strengthen me. But unfortunately, when you get that sorry, you don't ask God for help. You just get in a sorry state of being sorry about being such a sorrowful, sorry failure. <laughs> huh? Huh? And you stuck. It's time to do it differently. You don't even, you don't even live anymore. You don't even live anymore. You don't live anymore. You don't even, you don't even live anymore. You, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna make it write a song. You don't live. We just like write a song like I don't live anymore. It's you that lives in me. Something that you you need to write the song, so that you go around singing all the time until you get it. Till you begin to, till you begin to move and cooperate in every action, every deed, every word. In the basic reality of what Father's freely given to us, this unmeasurable, unimaginable gift is far beyond anything that we could think or ask. And so the Lord Jesus describes it here in Matthew 10, verse 39, and he says this. He that finds his life shall lose it. Have you found your life? Are you really satisfied with your life? In other words, this is what you live for every day. We get up at certain such a time every morning and we... We go off and we do these things and then we come back and we do these other things and then by that time we're finished with well, those things, we're done. And we say our good nights to the Lord Jesus and lay me downs. And then we get back up and we do the same thing over and again. And then we go to church so consumed with this world, so overwhelmed with this world to hear a preacher talk about heaven to just get sad and sorrowful some more. Huh? To run to our security the next day to where we feel really comfortable about our job because it's going to give us a predictable amount of income so we can be certain that we're going to be able to pay the bills so we can now lay our head upon our pillow at night and sleep calmly, <laughs> securely. <laughs> because to lose your life is to lose total control now. I don't believe that we have anything that's not deposited already in the kingdom of God. It's already deposited in heaven. I don't believe we have anything. I believe we can honestly say silver and gold have a none. It's deposited all in the kingdom of heaven. Someone said, you know, I have $42 million I'm holding for God. I'm not kidding you. I heard this story secondhand from a reliable source. I have $42 million I'm holding for God. And she was like very late in life, 70s or so. I wonder how long she's going to hold that. I guarantee you she's not holding it for God. She's holding it for her. She's not lost her life. She's totally in control. $42 million gives her position, gives her power, hmm? gives her influence, gives her security. You can't have what God wants to give you when that's going on. I'm a, I've got a degree in this and a degree in that. I built the world and fashioned and formed it. <laughs> Dr. Reverend Bishop Archangel.
our titles, our position. What do you do? Well, I'm a minister of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Did you know that it's a great opportunity for you to get to minister of the gospel of Jesus when people ask you, what do you do? Well, I'm a minister of the gospel. Well, it's easy for you to say, Pastor, because you pastor, you minister the gospel. <laughs> Did you read the Bible? Have you read the commission? Don't you realize? You, you sit down with people on the airplane all the time, what do they do? Well, what do you do? I minister the gospel. Here we go. I was in a room with a bunch of intellectuals. What do you do? Minister the gospel. Here we go. You what? Everybody basically looks down the floor. <laughs> Why did you, I did just hear him say that. Doesn't he know that this is the high and, high and lifted up ones in here? Jesus. I'm a preacher. Because of what's going on, that's like saying I'm a thief. It doesn't matter. Father's going to wipe all the shame away. Can we get comfortable? Can we just get comfortable living our life in Jesus? Saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed is the name of the living God. Hallelujah. Right there at work, at the work meeting. Praise God. Everybody's standing there talking and socializing, talking about what movie they watched last night or whatever. You're just over there, Pratos to Raymond and Goliath. Say, hallelujah. Praise What would you say? Oh, I'm just worshiping the Creator. I'm just worshiping Jesus. Have you, you know, the Holy Ghost is such a powerful influence in our life that we'll let him be. He's right here right now. You'd like to know about him? I mean, maybe the Lord doesn't fill your mouth with that, but you get to be who you are. Huh? Everybody can be who they want to be in the United States of America except for Christians. And you know how it got that way? Because we quit being who we were supposed to be in a public arena. We started playing pretend. Come on, we're going to get this. I was, telling, I was telling this guy, he's an elder in a church, elder in a free evangelical church, and I said, listen, I tell you, my passion is raising up people who are passionate about selling out everything to go everywhere, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, living it out just like Jesus showed us how to do it. With signs, wonders, miracles, and prosperity too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, come on. Don't sit around and look sad when you got that opportunity. <laughs> Don't act like God left you out. God didn't leave you out. He ain't left you out. Well, I've I'm, 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 I'm not been doing so well. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't. It's not on the basis of how well you've been doing it. It's on the basis of your willingness to allow God to live in you. Your willingness to say, I no longer live. Christ Jesus lives. And begin to pray the prayer. Lord, reveal your son in me. God who separated me from my mother's womb, who chose to reveal, who separated himself, separated me into his, from my mother's womb, to reveal his son in me. Paul's confession of faith. You were separated from your mother's womb by the living God so that Father could reveal his son, Christ Jesus, in you. And you're not going to be doing a very good job of that while you're out there spending your whole lifetime building a house. How long can it take you to build a house? Oh, your imagination. Three months. Thirty years. You have to let the Lord build it. You have to let the Lord build it. He that builds a house labors in vain unless the Lord builds a house. Whatever house it is you're building, Wherever you're at right now, the Lord set you down in that place so that you could learn to trust Him absolutely, to rely fully upon Him. He's allowed you to be in the place that you're in right now, to trust Him, to rely fully upon Him so that He can promote you into a whole greater dimension of usefulness. What will you do? Will you lose your life? If you, if you, he, the Lord says this, and, and you know He says it on the, and He says it on, on He says it on the level 
of the highest affections that we would have in our life. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me because you're going to get persecuted from your house. So he says, on the highest level of affections, on the highest level of interest. He said, in other words, you cannot allow even the most important relationships, the most important interests to deter you from doing that which I've called you to do. In this instance, we know what the Lord's talking about. Those who will persecute you will rise up from your own household. And especially in the Jewish community, you've got to say no to Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to be kicked out. He said, didn't get kicked out because if you love them more than, and you're more willing to please them and honor them and do right by them than you are by me, you're not worthy of me. So he says, here it is. Here's the context. He, that loved, he says, therefore, he that finds his life shall lose it. In what context? You must deny yourself. He that loses his life. He, listen, he that finds his life shall lose it. In what context? Willing to please those who are influential around your life and in your life more than you're willing to please God. Those who are willing to hold on to self-interest more than the interest of Father. I just want to define losing your life. I want to find it. I want to define it for you. I want to make it about relationship. I want to make it not about works. I want to make it about interaction. His actions towards you. Your response to that action. I will begin to worship. I worship him. Not out of obligation. Not because it's something religious. I watch some of you. You do it out of religion. And obligation. It's not reaction. And it goes on in churches all across the world. And I for one won't allow it. And so I'll speak consistently against it until it's all gone. I'll purge it with the fire of the word. Because when it is a reaction to him, it's going to be pa it's going to be passionate, it's going to be joyful, it's going to be, "Whoa, God, you're so good. you're amazing that you should love me." You being who you are, and I being who I am, that you should set me on high, that you should give me such a place with you, that you should give me such life, such glory. But come on now. At whatever level of maturity and revelation you are at right now, whether it's ankle deep or over your head, it's still going to produce a passionate, glorious reaction. Even if it's nothing but, he saved me. I'm his. I've got the gift of righteousness and holiness. I'm forever settled in him. I'm his. And he's mine. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If that's all that you have to shout about, that's enough to make you happy and start doing somersaults across the floor. Or however else it is that you express being happy. Little girls do somersaults. They get all giddy and happy and, huh, whatever it is. Jack Cole said, hot dog. Because he had not learned how to say hallelujah yet. But that was a hot dog right out of heaven. It was the truth and sincerity of his heart. It wasn't some funny, oh, he don't know how to say the words right. <laughs> the, criti the, cri the criticizers. And the spec finders. He don't know how. He doesn't know how to worship properly. Yeah, yeah, he did. That's exactly what Papa wanted. A hot dog from the heart, excited about a relationship with him. That's all he wanted. That's all he wanted. He didn't want no stale, lifeless, meaningless, not from the heart. Hallelujah. Huh? -huh. He didn't want no religious praise God. Come on now, people. There is an inspiration. There is an action, a continual action. I'm telling you, there's a continual action. A God's got continual action. All you and I have to be willing to do is allow our perception that he has given to us to kick in. A perception to be able to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. To see what eyes not seen, hear, hear what ears not heard. That perception will always be clouded, will always be blinded, will always be shrouded by the interest of this life. By the cares of this life. By the deceitfulness of riches. 
by the pursuit of self-interest. You hear me now? You hear me now? You listen to me. The spiritual law isn't hard to understand. Revival always starts in people's lives by them emptying out all that they have and laying it at the Father's feet. It always, it always starts with people selling out financially and giving it to the Lord, selling out materially, giving it to the Lord. Because all it is is a reflection of they sold out spiritually. They've given it all to God. Somebody said, oh, poor people, they've been taken advantage of. You know nothing. <laughs> God is a rewarder. He's the increaser. He doesn't, he doesn't sit silent when, when man has responded to his, his action. He in turn react, reacts and, and, and with actions even stronger than before, with blessings even greater than before. Huh? Bill Dad had hardly any understanding to what it was really that he was saying. He was just speaking good doctrine when he was declaring to Job those things in Job chapter 8. He had no idea what was about to happen to Job, who stood faithful in a trial as a champion of God. God don't need champions anymore. Jesus came, the final champion. Hallelujah. You and I get to live a champion life in him and in him alone. The contest is over. The, the end of men, you could say the fate of man is forever settled at Calvary's cross. Listen, you listen to me. You listen to me. Every miracle you, that you need is found in this passionate relationship and interaction with him. Every miracle you need. It's not going to be found in your doubt and your unbelief and your concerns and you're being overwhelmed with all the situations. It's found in this passionate interaction with him being overwhelmed with his love so much that you don't even care about nothing, not your own life, nothing anymore is valuable or meaningful to you. You watch what happens. You start fasting and you'll discover real quickly how things become meaningless. Your interest that you had will just fall off of you. It's, it's just something about the whole nature. Just... Almost, it's almost like a, a physical nature as well as a spiritual nature. Physical nature, all that's meaningful is water and food. And you're not getting much of either. That's all the priority. It's a physical thing. It becomes even that much more. There's an impact spiritually because our physical realm is so connected with our spiritual realm. You can't dissociate the two. God's going to have them live together forever. Oh, Shiban and Ahab. Oh, I pray in Jesus' name that what I'm talking about, that what God said in His Word will be something that you so believe that you will have it, you will lay hold on it at any price, at any cost. You'll do whatever it takes. You won't hold back. You won't draw back. You won't live securely. You won't protect yourself. You won't be guarded. Oh, we don't know that we can trust you, Pastor. We've been around you for 30 years, but we're not sure we can trust you. 80 years from now. Oh, we've been around you 80 years, but we're not sure that we can trust you yet. People live that way. I was talking to a man. Oh, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in, in churches. Oh, we just don't know that we can trust anybody. I heard somebody say the other day, I'd, never, I'd rather hang out with the cows than human beings. Buddy, you got a rough life. <laughs> oh, I'd just rather have me with the horses. What a perverted life. Dogs are better friends than human beings. But that isn't a de declaration of your insanity. <laughs> you with me? Something's been completely eaten out of you. Hmm? You have been shaped in the image of Satan who hates humanity. Hates humanity. God loves humanity. God loves humanity. Those who have God living in them continually grow such a love for men. No matter who they are, what state they're in. A compassion. To love them no matter how they act. To bless them no matter how they curse. Hallelujah. I tell you, the one thing that would have been hard for me to get over. The one thing that would have been hard for me to get over is if I would have been one of the disciples that Jesus left behind. When he said, come Peter and James, come go with me. Peter, James, John, come go with me. The rest of you guys stay here. I've been sitting there going. 
I, I wouldn't have got over that. I don't think I'd have got over that. When he came back, I'd have been saying, why? What must I do? And you know, it's sad, it's sad, it's, it's sad that, it's si- that, that, that that response is silent. It's not there in the Word. I'd have been throwing a fit, man. The Lord had found me in a pile of, of tears and agony. I got, what's wrong with you, Mark? You left me behind. I didn't get to go. Why? What must I do to change? I'll do anything. Where's your passion? What is it? What's important to you? Is is because that's ultimately what you're going to be. That's what's going to be revealed in your life. He loses his life for my sake. She'll find it. Listen to that. They have something, right? Huh? But there's a choice to be made as to whether or not they're going to be able to receive more. They have something. It's been given to them to know the mystery of the kingdom. They have something. To those who have, more shall be given to them. But there's got to be a faithfulness. There's got to be a willingness for increase. Not out of our own human effort. Because that's not what the Lord, the Lord doesn't, it isn't, he did, and I, this is so hard for people to get. He didn't define that upon the things that you do within the frameworks of all the, the achievements that you have. He refined it, defined it within the framework of the things that you do with respect to relationship with Him. How in love you are with Him. How dependent you are upon Him. He won't fail you. He won't let you down. He's faithful. That's one of His names. You can rely on Him. You can count on Him. And then the Lord takes it to another level. And says, anyone who receives you, receives me. Look at that next verse of Scripture. They receive you, they receive me. And fundamentally saying, they reject you, they reject me. Thank you, Father. We just we want all of you to be secure here in the Beloved. We want you to know that the opportunity has been given to you no matter where you're at. You may be at the beginning point. You may be at some middle point. Who knows where you're at? All you have to do is begin to rely upon the Holy Spirit, begin to interact with Him, begin to say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Whatever I have, it's yours. I give it to you. How can I be of service? What is it that you need? Master, I'm here to serve you. No, stop there. If you don't hear an answer, if you don't have a strong compulsion upon your heart, you just say, Lord, whatever you have need of, I'm here. I want to serve you. I want to serve you with my life. I want to serve you with the things that you've placed in my life that you've given to me. They're not mine. They're yours. How is it that we can serve you with them? You've given us strength. You've given us ability and energy. How can we take this strength and this energy and this ability and, and work for you and move for, for you and do these things which you want us to do? Look, people, listen to me. There's 500 million orphans right now. 500 million that could be saved. 500 million that be saved. I'm going to go for the 500 million. I want the 500 million. There's three, over 3 billion people that have never heard the gospel. Come on. Listen, listen. There's a whole church that needs to be stirred up. They need to have a vision cast for them of going into all the world and preaching the gospel, seeing a means by which to do it. A culture shift needs to be taken, uh, take place where no longer does ministry serve business. 
but business serves ministry, where our resources aren't lost to a secular world, but people have enough insight and ability and faith and anointing in God to raise up businesses that are able to take the human resources that are within the company of the saints. Now they're in the kingdom of God environment. They're working for the things that ultimately will profit the kingdom of God and making good salaries, but they're every waking hour is about generating finances that are going to do mass evangelism crusades, that are going to build churches, that are going to establish the work of the kingdom throughout the earth. Come on, it's got to happen. It's got, and it's going to happen by a force of passion. It's going to happen by a sheer determination and unwillingness to not to be denied. A, sin, a sense of what God has purposed that you must have it or die. Just sitting around lethargically, barely able to lift your little old hand and go hallelujah. Barely able to shout and praise God. There's only a, a testimony that the job is never going to get done. That's all it is. It's only a revelation of the lack of passion, the lukewarmness. At best, the mildness. I know mildness in me about God. I'm going to give my life upon the altar of sacrifice, not because I'm obligated to. Because I love him. Because I'm overwhelmed by his actions. All I'm doing is a reaction <laughs> to that which he has displayed upon me and before me. <laughs> Mostly just in the interaction of his word. Hallelujah. But also in the interaction of the things of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, what He's actually doing. And then those special things, you know, when, like we just had, and, and, and when we were, I want to I worship here a little bit in just a minute. Those things that we just went through, and, and I haven't been apart for a long time. And we're just like, you know, we don't like being apart at all. We're like, we're never being apart. But I didn't want to take her out in the backwoods of nowhere and have her sit in a lousy hotel. And then, of course, Anna, we had Anna here, and, and we didn't want, definitely didn't want to put that on Anna. That would have been even worse. It just said, like, here I am, Father. I'll give myself off myself on an altar sacrifice. This is the last thing I've ever wanted to do. But I, this has got to be done. It has to be done. I see, and I, you know, See very clearly the need. See very clearly the purpose. And I was laying there and just having this encounter with the Lord. And just laying there on that nasty bed. Just praying that I wouldn't be bitten by all the bed bugs and that thing. <laughs> Visualizing a rat running across the top of me in the night. <laughs> just overwhelmed by the really. It wasn't, it was, you know, on that level at first, it really was, those kind of things, you know. I was actually praying, Lord, protect me against the bed bugs. You know, I said, just His presence, His manifest presence, Lord, where I begin to pray, where the Spirit of the Son begin to pray through me, talking to the Father, Father, I'm here, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Thank you, Father, that you hear my voice right now, and just to have that revelation, to have that knowledge, that sense, that overwhelming glory, His presence, where you know you have audience with the Almighty, standing in the presence of the King. And then to hear him just speak to me. Now I want you to move in a deeper realm of faith now. If you're going, just begin to think about it. If you are going to participate, reality, not make believe, reality, with impacting 500 million orphans' lives, with impacting over 3 billion people that have never heard the gospel, on every level, stirring up the churches for the human resources to go, providing the conduit, the avenue, the network for them to go in, the anointing, the framework of government, the framework of, of, of wisdom and business to do it. It's got to consume you. What consumes you? What would you allow to distract you? For this is the kingdom. This is the gospel program. I don't know what it is you're doing. But you're going to have to put it within the framework of what God's called you to do. And understand the opportunity that has been given you and define how you're going to prosper and how you're going to increase and begin to understand whether or not you're hiding it in the earth because of human security, because of distrust, hmm? because of intimidation or whatever the case may be, I don't know. 
I, don't know, I do not know what holds men back from fully surrendering to the one who emptied himself that we might live forever in him. I tell you, there is not a greater place of ecstasy than knowing that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. There's not a greater place of joy than knowing that you are acceptable in the beloved. For knowing your partnership, your meaning, your value, your purpose. As co-inheritors with Jesus, you got to shout about that all the time. <laughs> it, it, it influences every decision you make. Well, it, it don't matter what you're doing. Television, t radio, places you go. I always have an opportunity to preach. I was riding with some of these heathens. And one said, oh, look over, look at this woman. Woo! Hey, he's nudging me. I said, listen, man, I don't look. I made a covenant with my eyes. That's unrighteousness. Ultimately, what that's going to result in is your soul being lost forever. And he's like, oh, he's apologizing. I said, no, it's a choice you make. You make the choice of what you're going to do with your life, right or wrong. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I won't look. I see him. We always got an opportunity to preach. There's an opportunity to reprove. The darkness. God gives us opportunities right, left, and center. When we caught up in Him, we get to make full opportunities like oh, those opportunities without being insulting. Huh? Mm -hmm. Without being condemning. True. Just being who we are. No, no, man. You're asking me to do something I'm not going to do. I'm going to lose myself forever in hell. You mean you believe in hell? I believe in hell. I, I'm certain about hell. I want to take all of my influence. If people think I'm bright, I want to take all that they think I'm intelligent. With and prove to them that they're going to hell unless they accept Jesus. You think I'm intelligent? And well, let me tell you, this intelligence has caused me to understand that there is a living God and He's made a way for us to be forever with Him. In the realm called life, you can choose today to live in death if you want. We've chose to live in life. There's no way in except for Jesus. I don't care how good you live. I don't care what you think about yourself. I know how people say, well, you know, no one's perfect. Listen, nobody asking you to be perfect. We ask you to do what's right. <laughs> We're telling you right now that there is a good, no matter what men do, no matter how perfect they live, they still vile before God. There's only one way to get cleaned up. You call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And the Father God will take His blood and come and cleanse you and wash you. And make you new and give you a new start and allow you to become a part of the heavenly plan. Until you do that, you're dead in your trespasses and sin. And there's only an eternity for hell, of hell awaiting you. There's only the powers of darkness ruling over you. And God calling you to come out. Talking to you that are listening by the web on YouTube right now. The people that are here in this place. The Spirit of the living God pleads with you. He begs with you. I pray in Jesus' name that from this day forward... You will be haunted with the reality of your unrighteousness and your wickedness. You'll be haunted with the reality of your sin and your trespass against the living God and of men. So that there's a possibility you just cry out for help. The slightest little call for help. God will answer. You don't have to beg Him. You just simply ask. In the sincerity of your heart. Father's not looking for people or interested in people who don't want to be delivered from sin. There are many people who want to call upon the name of Jesus and live in their sin. They're not looking for a deliverer. They're looking for some insurance policy or whatever. I don't know what it is. He's a deliverer. He's the one that's come and deliver you from the state of sin. Deliver you from the oppression of darkness and from the wickedness that bound you. I, for one, wanted to be delivered. And I found a deliverer, and his name is Jesus. I'm sure that most of the people in here, if not all the people in here, came to deliver her because they wanted to be delivered from sin. From the curse of it that marred our life and influenced every action. To the power and the ability to say no to it. To understand the vileness of it. If the purest man is vile before the Lord, how vile are the wicked. 
Now, I'm not talking about the purest men washed in the blood. I'm talking about the purest of men within respect to the framework of humanity. Because of Adam's sin and Adam's transgression. Jesus. Box to Gina Maladea. What will you do with the remainder of your life? I care not about what you've done. It matters not about what I've done. I'm not going to talk about, stand around and talk about what I've done. You know, I'm not going to talk about the things that we've done in the past is to stir faith for the future. That's it. It's about what we're doing and where we're headed and what we're going to do. Somebody said, oh, you did this and you did that. Come on, people. You failed here, you failed there. You succeeded here, you succeeded there. It matters not. What will you do now? How will you respond this day to the call of God? Would you continue to come in here and occupy a seat with a heart that's already made up its mind that you're not going to change, that you're going to do it your way? Oh, well, the Lord says that you're not even supposed to be a part of the body of Christ. You come in here with a heart. You might have failed. You might have done despiteful against the things of God. But you have in your heart, you want to get right, you want to do right. My goodness, the Holy Ghost will never let go of you. He continue to lay, lay a hold on you, plead with you, beg with you, and say, let me show you how to live this life, how to walk in the glory of it. You can come in here today as I, with a sold-out passion to only please God and be still just as ever be dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ and His righteousness as the vilest man that ever lived. There's no difference. There's no difference. It's, I have nothing in myself by which I come to Him. Nothing that I have done by which I come to Him. Before or after knowing Him. Before I was born again or after being filled with the Spirit. Nothing. I find myself only rightfully here and before Him right now able to stand and do anything that I do in Him because of that which Jesus Christ gave to me when He gave me His blood, when He gave me His Holy Spirit. And that place, dear people, I believe is the only place that will prosper in God and increase in the Lord. I want you to stand with me. Somebody said, well, you've done this. You've done that. One preacher came up to me and said, you, I'm sure you're going to heaven. And it's based upon this thing and that thing and the other thing. During the time period where the Lord just hooked me up with just about every ministry that he raised up. And it's just, people looking at me, how did you get to know him? How did you get to know him? My connection is from the Father. I'm just honest with you. I'm not trying to be spiritual. I didn't do it. And you know, the reality of it is, it's, so many, and he was serious. And we, we, we categorize ourselves. And we, we make ourselves significant or I I insignificant on by, on based upon what we get to do. No, we all in Him. We all in Him. And what we have, we have received. And the measure of grace that we have, we have received from Him. But don't you be like an Esau. And don't you be like someone who's lukewarm. Or willing to just let things go as they are. You get passionate. You get determined. Um, you get determined with God. Something that can only happen. In the secret place of your life, in your heart. Behind the closed doors of your life. Or you begin to say, Father, I don't care about my interaction so much with men. And how I'm perceived by men. I'm now only interested in my interaction with you and how I'm perceived by you. And I, wanna, I want more of you. More of you is available right now. More of, more of him is available right now. When you say, Lord, I want more of you. I can tell you more of you. More of him is available right now. 
Hey, baby. Hey, my darling. Father, thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the anointing. I just love hearing Anna walk around the house singing her worship song. She sings nonstop. She's, one time, I think she sang for eight hours because we were in the car for 13 and the majority of it she was singing. Goes right from one song to the next. She didn't get tired. She might fall off to sleep for a few minutes, but she'll wake right back up. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, and all that is within.